Well, hi there, and happy Dinosaur December. This is not a dinosaur, and neither is this, and neither is this. But this is, and so is this, and so is this. Dinosaurs are not the only ancient reptiles. They're not the oldest, but they are the biggest, not only reptiles, but creatures that have ever walked the planet. Notice that I didn't say swam. Those are still alive today. But today, I want to introduce you to every major group of dinosaurs. And I want to show you the biggest members of each of those groups. But I also want to go the other way. We often focus on how big dinosaurs were, but how small did they get? We almost never talk about that. So while we're going to look at the biggest members of each group, we are also going to try to determine what the smallest members were as well and how these groups are related. As I mentioned before, not all ancient reptiles are dinosaurs. In fact, all of the major reptile lineages alive today were alive alongside the dinosaurs, as well as many more. We'll have a whole video later this month, Dinosaur December, all about some of these other ancient reptiles. But dinosaurs are a unique group of reptiles that are all more closely related to one another than they are to any other group of reptiles. Their closest living relatives alive today are the crocodilians. I don't say birds because birds are not the relatives of dinosaurs. They simply are dinosaurs. And it isn't that all of the dinosaurs turned into birds, but rather that the only lineage of dinosaurs alive today are the birds. And if you're interested in that lineage, we have a whole video about them and all of their closest relatives, the Maniraptoran dinosaurs. And if you want to know why they survived when all of the other dinosaurs died off, we'll have a video on that here in a few weeks. Dinosaur December is good. But today, we have a bigger picture to examine. All of the dinosaurs. And this is a phylogeny of all of the major groups of dinosaurs. Now, I should mention that this phylogeny is up for debate. Some new findings have definitely cast some doubt on it. The biggest question being about the correct placement of the theropod dinosaurs. Do they belong over here with the sauropods as they traditionally have been? Or over here with everybody else? But with one group of theropods, the Herosauridae, still over here with the sauropods. Without DNA evidence, we're restricted to making assessments of relatedness based on fossils. I'm going to present things today in the more broadly recognized groupings, but be aware that they will likely change to some degree as we learn more about these amazing animals. So let's talk first about how we know what we are seeing is a dinosaur, as many ancient reptiles are often mistaken for dinosaurs. One thing that is somewhat easy to see on most dinosaur skeletons is that they have two holes on each side of the skull behind the eye, one right here and one right here. This makes them diapsids. That alone will tell you that animals like Dimetrodons and Gorgonopsians are not dinosaurs. Couple that with an erect stance as opposed to the sprawling stance that you see with most other reptiles, and you probably have a dinosaur. But there are a few other groups of erect diapsids. So to be sure, there are a ton of very subtle little things you could look for on the skeleton. But the one that I think is the easiest to notice is that the radius, the smaller of the two bones in the forearm, is short, less than 80% of the length of the humerus, the comical bone in the upper arm. If you ever decide to share this fact with your friends and family at the museum and they look less than impressed, just say that you found this humerus and then show yourself out. Anyway, now that you can identify a true dinosaur from the many imposters and wannabes, let's dig into this clade and reveal the biggest and the smallest to ever walk the earth. The dinosaurs have historically been broken into two large clades, based mostly on their hip morphologies. These clades being the lizard hip dinosaurs, the Saurischians, and the bird hip dinosaurs, the Ornithischians. The birds are in one of these two groups. Try to guess which one. I think you'll be pleasantly surprised. Or, at the very least, uh, a, little, a little bit confused. The lizard hip dinosaurs include two big groups, the sauropods and the theropods. All of the rest of the dinosaurs fall into the bird-hipped dinosaurs, the ornithischians. By bird-hipped, what that means is that the pubis bone points backwards, as it does in birds. 
They are also unified by the presence of a beak-like structure in front of the teeth, as well as a reduced or even absent ant orbital fenestra, which is this hole that's right here in the skull, uh, at least in many dinosaurs, that's between the eye and the nose. So this is the ant orbital fenestra, and that's often reduced or completely absent in the Ornithischian dinosaurs, as well as a host of less conspicuous features. And given that most of the dinosaurs fall into this clade, let's just start with them. The major clade most distantly related to the rest of the Ornithischians happens to be my favorite clade of Ornithischians, the armored dinosaurs of the clade Thyreophora. This clade includes the Stegosauria and the Ankylosauria. These can be identified fairly easily as their dorsal surface is covered with some sort of osteoderms or bony plates, and they often have clubs or spikes on their tails. They're like giant murder turtles, though not actually related very closely to turtles. They also have longer hind legs than forelegs, likely an artifact of the fact that ancestral dinosaurs were all bipedal. And they also have small brains for their size. Stegosauria can be identified by the fact that they generally had plates on their backs and spikes on their tails. Also, their heads tended to be long and skinny, unlike the Ankylosauria, and their back legs were even more disproportionately long compared to their front legs. The largest of the Stegosaurians was also the most famous, Stegosaurus, reaching lengths of over seven and a half meters, 25 feet, and weighing more than 5,000 kilos, over 11,000 pounds. That's about the size of an African elephant. Interestingly, the Stegosaurus went extinct about 145 million years ago, meaning that the amount of time between Stegosaurus and T. rex is greater than the amount of time between T. rex and you. It's a little harder to say which species is the smallest that we have found, as smaller species tend to be among the oldest members of the group with tiny, fragile bones. Thus, they're less likely to be well-preserved than their bigger, more recent relatives. Also, small individuals may not be fully grown. So if the only specimens we have happen to be juveniles, we might greatly underestimate the size of the species as a whole. But Chunkingosaurus seems to be one of the smallest of all Stegosaurians, coming in at around 4 meters, 13 to 16 feet, and weighing between 1,000 and 3,000 kilograms, or 2,200 to 6,600 pounds. It's about the size of a white rhinoceros, so not small. Ankylosaurians, on the other hand, tended to have armor more like a turtle shell in appearance than the plates of Stegosaurus. Though some had spikes, bony clubs were a common feature. Their back legs, while longer than their front legs, are not as different in length as the Stegosaurians, and they have much broader heads. The largest of the Ankylosaurians is, as was the case with the Stegosaurians, the best known of them all, Ankylosaurus, which came in at 6 to 8 meters, 20 to 26 feet, and 4,800 to over 8,000 kilos. That's 10,600 to 18,000 pounds. That's about the size of an orca, and considerably bigger than any Stegosaurian. These guys lived in the Cretaceous, which is where the dinosaurs grew to their largest sizes. And the smallest of which I have found is also one of the oddest of all Ornithischian dinosaurs, Leoningosaurus. Leoningosaurus from late Cretaceous China is truly small, coming in at about 34 centimeters, which is just over a foot. It's the size of Bubba Chunk, my adult common snapping turtle. Maybe not even that big. That alone is odd. But that isn't the only thing about it that was odd, or that it had in common with Bubba Chunk. It was also carnivorous, or at least omnivorous, as one of the two known specimens was found with a belly full of fish, which actually helped explain a lot of its other bizarre features, such as its unfused limbs and long legs adapted for swimming, and sharp teeth and claws for grabbing and dismembering prey. This is the only Ornithischian dinosaur verified to have eaten meat, and one of the very few highly aquatic dinosaurs, though more will come up today. An ankylosaurid as weird as it is tiny. 
By the way, today's video is sponsored by the Ridge Wallet, which Jason, Will, and I have all been carrying for multiple years now. I have the carbon, it's like pressed carbon, and Jason got this titanium, it's like, what is it, worn titanium? Stone-washed, Stone-washed titanium, stinking rad. Will got the Damascus steel. Honestly, like these are some of my favorite ones. And then we just recently got a whole bunch of new ones. We got this one I like to call the Stormtrooper. It's white and it's got this really cool texture I didn't know it was gonna have. This one is the Narrows here in Utah and it even has the GPS coordinates for exactly where this is. We've got one in like the slate gray graphite and we actually have the complete daily driver kit which includes this really cool key carrier that at first when I saw it, I was like, why would you want that? And then we put keys in it and it is so smooth and silent and it's a great way to carry around a number of keys. It has a little clip, which you could take off, but you could also use it to clip it to your pocket the way that I do with my Skeletool. I think, I think this thing is surprisingly good. Anyway, they've got some amazing products from Ridge, not just wallets, but I mean, we've got pens and we got multi-tools, they've got knives, they've got all kinds of stuff now. And right now you can save up to 40% if you go to ridge.com slash Clint. So if you want any of these Ridge products, now's the time. That's ridge.com slash Clint. The remaining major Ornithischian groups fall into the clade Neornithischia. This clade contains two major clades, the Marginocephalia and the Ornithopoda. The Ornithopoda includes some really well-known dinosaurs, such as Iguanodon and Parasaurolophus. Ornithopoda means bird feet, and that doesn't mean that birds are closely related to the Ornithopoda, but the majority of the Ornithopods did have three toes that touched the ground like many birds. And this was unusual for Ornithischian dinosaurs. Additionally, the Ornithopods lacked any sort of armor, horns, or spikes other than a spiky thumb in some groups were generally bipedal, had an elongated pubis bone that was in some cases so long that it extended past the ilium, and had a very sophisticated chewing apparatus that lacked a horny beak, as well as lacking a hole in the lower jaw, called the mandibular fenestra. Basically, these are bipedal herbivores that became super successful due to their amazing chewing ability and not because of their impressive defensive weapons. The largest of them all was Shantungosaurus. This giant duckbill from late Cretaceous China was 15 meters, 49 feet long, and 13 to 16,000 kilos, about 35,000 pounds. That would be three bull African elephants, two orcas, or one satang whale, which is not the smallest of the rorquals. And in case you don't know what a rorqual is, you're really gonna enjoy our video about the whales. The smallest, as far as I can find, would be the 1.7 meter long Gasparinosaura from the late Cretaceous in what is today Argentina. These little guys weighed around 30 pounds, 13 kilograms, or about the size of a white throat monitor. And it has got to be close to the top of my list of non-avian dinosaurs that would make awesome pets. The closest relatives to the Ornithopoda are the super popular dinosaurs of the clade Marginocephalia. I think it is entirely possible that you have never heard the word marginocephalia, but you know its members, the Ceratopsia and the Pachycephalosauria. Again, the Ankylosaurs are my favorite Ornithischians, but if your favorite falls into one of these two groups, I totally get it. The Ceratopsia, such as Triceratops, needs little introduction. Though it may surprise you to learn that the earlier members of the group were hornless, frillless, and bipedal. But they still had that diagnostic parrot-like curved bony beak at the end of their upper jaw called the rostral bone. They also had the large flared out jugal bones beneath their eyes that are characteristic of ceratopsians. And the largest of them all was the Eotriceratops of North America. Like most of the largest dinosaurs, these were found in the Cretaceous, and they were enormous. Triceratops means three-horned face, Eotriceratops being the early Triceratops, which was, at least as far as we have so far discovered, even larger than the later Triceratopses, though they too were very large. The head alone of Eotriceratops is 10 feet or 3 meters long, that's almost twice as long as the skull of Shantungosaurus, 
despite the fact that EO Triceratops was only about 30 feet long, 9 meters, and weighed about 10,000 kilos or 22,000 pounds. So it wasn't as big overall as Shantungosaurus, but still the size of the biggest African elephant ever recorded. Bigger than any Stegosaurus, and with a head much bigger than that of Shantungosaurus. And equipped with a defensive frill and three horns, with the largest two measuring almost a meter in length. That's plenty long enough to kill an adult Tyrannosaurus Rex. And unlike Stegosaurus, they probably did actually have to defend themselves from the Tyrant Lizard King. But, as was mentioned earlier, not all Ceratopsians were quadrupedal frilled horned giants. Aquilops from the early Cretaceous was also found in North America, but measured only 0.6 meters, less than 2 feet long, and weighed only 1.5 kilos, just over 3 pounds. It's the size of a teacup Yorkie. And cool as a pocket dog may be, I'd rather have a pocket Ceratopsian for sure. The closest relatives to the Ceratopsians are my son Owen's favorite dinosaurs, the Pachycephalosauria, thick-headed lizards. And I've never tried to talk him out of it. They're rad, and he knows more dinosaurs than I do. Other than not being lizards, the name thick-headed lizards makes a lot of sense. Pachycephalosaurs have really thick skulls that they likely used as a weapon almost like bipedal mountain sheep. The largest of them all, Pachycephalosaurus from Cretaceous North America, while not huge, was 4.5 meters, a bit less than 15 feet long, and weighed 450 kilograms, less than 1,000 pounds. About the same as a bull elk, and like six times as much as a mountain sheep. So I'd rather take a hit off of a mountain sheep. But I'd much rather take a headbutt off of the smallest of the Pachycephalosaurs, Micropachycephalosaurus from China, which is the longest genus name for any dinosaur. And yet, it was only one meter long. That is just over an inch per letter. And it likely weighed less than 10 pounds, so considerably smaller than Gus Gus. However, as the skull dome has not yet been discovered, there is some doubt that it is an actual Pachycephalosaur. And that gets us to the other big lineage of dinosaurs, the lizard-hipped dinosaurs of the clade Saurischia. Saurischian dinosaurs can easily be distinguished from the Ornithischian dinosaurs by their hip structure with the pubis pointing forward, similar to that of other reptiles. Though two groups of Saurischians in the Maniraptora, the Therizinosaurs and the Avialans, both independently evolved a rear-facing pubis like that in the Ornithischians. Other traits that might be used to identify them would be the lack of a beak, though it was present in some, and a more well-defined hole in the skull between the nose and the eye called the antorbital fenestra. But you can see why these relationships can be a bit difficult to determine using only fossil evidence. That said, the Saurischia have historically included two very conspicuous groups of dinosaurs, the Theropoda and the Sauropoda. The Sauropoda are the biggest animals ever to have lived on land. They can generally be distinguished by their long necks and tails, relatively small heads, and quadrupedal stance. They had sturdy back legs with five toes, though only three or four of those toes possessed claws. Their front legs were more slender, but still used for supporting huge amounts of weight, and with a claw often only on the thumb. And they had air sacs down into their bones. Likely, they breathed in a way similar to that of birds, which is to say that they were highly efficient at extracting oxygen from the air. This is something they have in common with the Theropoda as well. Originating in the late Triassic, by the end of the Cretaceous, they dominated the land nearly everywhere on Earth. Though the longest was likely Supersaurus, a diplodocid measuring over 115 feet, 35 meters. The largest by total mass was likely the Argentinosaurus, a titanosaur, which lived in the late Cretaceous in what is today Argentina, though I very much doubt they respected the future national borders of Argentina. I say it was likely the largest because we don't have any complete specimens to evaluate. But we estimate it to have been almost as long as Supersaurus. But because it was a Titanosaur and not a Diplodocid, which are very long due to their long, skinny tails, this thing was much more massive. Perhaps weighing more than 80,000 kilograms, or about 180,000 pounds. There are only four whales that weigh more than that. 
And only the blue whale is heavier than the higher estimates for its total size. It's 15 times the size of the largest land animal alive today, a bull African bush elephant. Unspeakably huge. And yet the smallest sauropod may also have been a titanosaur, the comparatively diminutive Magiarosaurus. Though other species like Omdenosaurus, which we know from a single shin bone, may have been even smaller. Magyarosaurus from late Cretaceous Romania was only 6 meters, 20 feet long, and weighed less than 1,000 kilos, 2,200 pounds. That's not small, it's about the size of a female giraffe. But for a sauropod, that is downright dainty. And the reason for this daintiness is likely associated with the fact that these titanosaurs were found on islands where food is more limited, leading often to dwarfism in large endothermic animals like mammals and dinosaurs. This is called insular dwarfism. And though it was not very big, it was defended by dermal armor, which is pretty cool. Now why would a giant dinosaur need armor? I mean, giraffes don't have any. Well. The Cretaceous was full of some predators that make giraffe predators like lions look like a snack. And many of them were part of the last group of dinosaurs, the Theropoda. A group that needs little introduction as it includes the biggest carnivore the world has ever seen. Well, at least as long as we're only discussing terrestrial macro predators. Because blue whales are the largest predators the world has ever seen, and sperm whales are still a larger macro predator. But the largest land predator of all time likely was a theropod, even if not the one Dr. Grant was referencing. Which is funny because there are two real contenders for that title, and by that point Dr. Grant had already faced both of them. But before we get to which was the largest, let's talk about the theropods. The theropods, like the sauropods, have hollow bones and probably breathe like birds. Or are birds in some cases. Unlike the sauropods, they were generally bipedal with highly reduced forelimbs. While most appear to have been carnivores, the group also includes many likely omnivores and even herbivores. The longest of them all appears to have been Spinosaurus, which is a highly aquatic dinosaur. Of course, as we learn from the Supersaurus, being the longest doesn't necessarily mean that it's the biggest. Dr. Grant informed us that the biggest carnivore the world has ever seen was the South American Carcharodontosaurid, Giganotosaurus. And Giganotosaurus was almost as long as Spinosaurus, and probably considerably more massive. So maybe he was right. But visual acuity is dependent largely on the absolute size of the eye. And I just mention that because Dr. Grant also told us that the T-Rex, the animal with the largest eyes and possibly the best vision of any land animal ever, can't see you if you don't move. Not only could it likely see you, it could likely spot you easily from hundreds of meters away. And at this point in time, it appears that the Tyrant Lizard King was not only the land vision champion of history, but was also the most massive of all theropods, despite having some recently discovered competition. Sorry, Dr. Grant. You know I love you. And in fairness, the size estimates for Giganotosaurus and T-Rex are very close to one another, with both coming in at a maximum size well over 8,000 kilos, around 18,000 pounds. That's about the same size as an Arno's beaked whale. Which if you didn't know that these giants existed, I have a video that you're really going to enjoy after this. The reality is that Tyrannosaurus rex was a very bulky brawler. And given that it is probably the most studied of all dinosaurs, we have a lot more specimens and information about their size than we do any of their close size rivals. So as we discover more about Giganotosaurus, maybe we will find some individuals larger than our largest tyrannosaurs. For now, the Tyrant Lizard King from late Cretaceous North America is also the king of all theropods. And while we're on the subject of the Tyrant Lizards and their king, how many other tyrannosaurs can you name? If the answer is none, or not very many, good news, we'll be diving into that group in its entirety later this month. But for now, what is the smallest of the theropods? Well, interestingly enough, the smallest known theropod is alive right now, and that would be the bee hummingbird from Cuba. 
These birds are about six centimeters, 2.5 inches long, and weigh two to about 2.5 grams, about as much as a penny. But excluding the birds, another Manny Raptoran dinosaur would hold the title. The comparatively enormous Anchiornis from late Jurassic China. These little theropods are known from only one place, but from hundreds of very well-preserved specimens. We even know what color they were, they were so well-preserved. They were about the size of a crow, measuring about 34 centimeters, one foot in total length, and weighing about 250 grams, or about half a pound. Like birds and many other Manny Raptorans, they were heavily feathered. Possessing four wings, they were potentially excellent gliders. And that concludes our tour of the largest and smallest of each major group of dinosaurs. But Dinosaur December is only beginning, so as always, like and subscribe, and we hope to see you real soon. Oh, it's Giganotosaurus, dang it. Can you double check the pronunciation on that one? That's an Owen pronunciation, so. He's probably right, but he's also nine. Uh, <laughs>